We have the CEO of the Climate Group, that's Helen Clarkson. Uh, the Climate Group also is, works with um, We Mean Business, which is a larger coalition group. And we're also very lucky to have Maria Mendeluce. He's the CEO of We Mean Business. Maria, I hope I didn't butcher your last name. Um, in any case, welcome both of you. We're delighted to have both of you. Um, so I think where I'd like to start today is obviously it feels like 2020 was in some way a watershed year. And I don't know whether other people feel that way for business engagement. It started with BlackRock um, and it's gone all the way through to lots of very impressive net zero pledges, China being one fabulous example, but also Walmart. So I was hoping we could start off with each of you talking a little bit about your work uh, and and what you think about 2020, where we are. Is this been a watershed year? Maria, why don't we start with you? Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, 2020 has been definitely a decisive year, uh, I think, for climate, not uh, uh, for unexpected uh, reasons. I think uh, through the COVID pandemic, uh, the world has realized that actually the climate crisis is, is, uh, is could be biggest, uh, bigger than the, the COVID pandemic and that we need to get ready. And that as we uh, build back uh, through stimulus packages, we need to make sure that those are uh, deployed uh, in solutions that can help us uh, create jobs, uh, uh, boost the econo economic growth, but also reduce emissions. So I think that that has been something that has, it was quite unforeseen. And now we're going to see in the European Union, $500 billion being spent in stimulus packages on climate change, which was not expected. And so I think, in, yeah, for the wrong reasons, maybe because of COVID, uh, Climate action has accelerated both from a company perspective that we're going to talk a lot, but also from a government uh, priorities and investment perspective, which is definitely, you know, both are going to be very positive for, for climate change. And Helen, do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, I think and it's interesting. How, how do we think about 2020? So, you know, when we or at Climate Week, one of the things that the Climate Group does is we run Climate Week NYC every year. We come together in New York. And last year in September, we were talking about the climate decade, that we've got to halve emissions across the 2020s so that by 2030, we've halved emissions. So it was always going to be a really big and important year for the climate. Um, and we were sort of gearing up for that. And it was going to be a really important UN uh, discussion in December, the COP that's going to be in the UK. So we were looking at it a lot from a UK point of view. And then, of course, COVID came along. And I think the initial thing was a kind of what will this do on the climate? Does it put all of that back? We know the science tells us we don't have time to wait. We can't put things back. Uh, I think a lot of us working in the environmental movement remember the financial crisis in 08, 09 and the, and the kind of the story then was like, don't talk to us environmentalists. You know, let's get back to business as usual. Then we'll come back to talking to you. And so like, is that going to happen again? And actually what we've found is pretty different. So we work with over 350 businesses and we polled them back in sort of April, May. So first sort of wave of the crisis and said, well, how does this affect your climate plans? And over 96% said, doesn't change them. Still really, really important. There was also polling around the same time of, you know, the general public. What do you want? We don't want to go back to how things were. And I think what we're starting to see is an understanding of the amount of money that's got to go into economies now. How do we get out of this economic, you know, recession, depression, whatever we're going into, biggest economic crisis in decades, and a much better understanding that there is a way to spend that money in a way that helps achieve climate goals. So governments are starting to talk more smartly. Businesses are saying, we still want to do this. In the same poll, over half the business, around half the businesses said, we want to do this, but we need more government support. And I think what we're seeing is this really interesting emergence of some kind of consensus, finally, that there's a way that you can tackle the environment and jobs in a kind of cohesive, strategic, systemic way. Right. I think when, so Joe Biden, who's a candidate for Democratic, uh, the Democratic candidate for president here in the United States, has certainly linked climate and jobs in his green stimulus plan. 
Um, the European Union has certainly done that as well. Are we seeing that globally? Do most countries or most uh, unions have a chance to do that globally? Or is that really something we're just seeing in the United States and Europe? Uh, Maria or Helen? I think it's broader. I don't know if Maria's got a sense. You know, we heard it in the UK just yesterday. Um, it's conference party, uh, party conference season, they call it here, where all the political parties sort of set out their stall for the next year. And Boris Johnson, the prime minister, was talking about build back greener. Um, it's it's certainly picking up. We've seen it, you're right, we've seen it particularly in Europe. Um, we've had sort of bailouts being attached to things like the aviation industry saying, right, there's got to be conditions on those. So these ideas are starting. I think it is reaching into Asia for sure. We've seen, um, we run something called the RE100 campaign, which is a commitment to 100% renewable electricity um, by companies. And that's been actually name checked in, uh, I think the South Korean recovery plan saying business is right, you've got to join this. So we're seeing all parts of the globe as they start to think about this, we are seeing pick up. I wouldn't, I don't know if it's how universal it is, but I think it's interesting, as you mentioned, um, China, we're seeing increased ambition coming. And and, I, and I'd say the other way, we're not seeing sort of the breaks on it that we might have thought. And so that's good to see. Maria, did you wanna yeah. weigh in on this? Yeah, well, I think in addition to what Helen has said, I mean, some of the, the countries, developing countries, of course, do not have the resources to invest uh, and they just need to get out of the COVID crisis. But what is happening in, in China, Europe and the US, uh, if Freedom wins the election, then it's quite positive because it will have a positive uh, um, impact in the deployment, the large, large scale deployment of technologies, bringing through economies of scales the cost down, and then developing countries will benefit from that. So. So I think uh, some countries are leading and others will also benefit from, from it. Well, they will benefit, but also taking into consideration that some countries are also providing goods and services to the developed countries. So, so I think it's all positive. Well, so we're seeing a lot of pledges from very big companies. Um, I guess I have two questions along that line and we can take them one after the other. The first would be, are these companies actually, uh, are these real pledges, do we follow up? I mean, obviously they're great, they're great PR, but what mechanisms do we have to effectively follow up? And do we want companies making pledges that basically are far beyond their technological means right now? And then I think afterwards we can talk about the role of small and medium sized businesses because we hear a lot about big companies, but there are also some small and medium sized, lots of small and medium sized businesses, and we need to know where they fit in this. So let's start with the big corporations. They're saying a lot of the good things. Do we feel confident that we have the mechanisms in place to follow up to make sure that they're doing what they say and that there is the technology that they can do what they say? Do you want to start, Maria? Sure. Oh, I was going to say, why don't yeah. I start on that and Maria will take the um, SMEs. I think she'll do, she will answer that better than me. So I'll, I'll leap in on this one. So okay. for the companies that make commitments, so at the Climate Group, we run these big commitment campaigns, RE100, I've already talked about, EP100, which is a doubling of energy productivity, and EV100, which is about corporate fleet commitments on electric vehicles. Yeah. And with all of those, we check in every year on how they're doing against those commitments. So it's not enough just to make the commitment, you're right. We then need accountability and we follow through and we both do data gathering exercises. We partner with CDP, who are a big data gathering NGO, another NGO in the Women in Business Coalition on the RE100 data um, in particular to look at how are they doing on, on um, renewable energy. And then we gather the other data with other partners we also then go to the partners and say, well, what is stopping you go faster? You know, what are the barriers? So we've got qualitative and we've got quantitative data. And then we particularly share then the, the good news story. So we look at where a company's doing well and we use a sort of positive reinforcement mechanism to show where are things happening, where are things going faster, use that to give other com uh, companies confidence to make commitments, but we are looking across the piece at how is everyone doing, is everyone following through, and making sure that we only showcase really and push those companies. Um, we push all the companies, but we showcase particularly where companies are hitting their targets ahead to sort of keep, you know, accelerating the story. Um, 
what we have seen in reporting as well, I think where companies do it really well, where they publish their own reports, is where they do admit where they're not hitting targets. And I think Unilever have been a company that's absolutely outstanding on this, is being very clear, we're hitting these, these and these targets, these are targets we're not hitting. And that really helps, again, people understand that picture. On the technology thing, we definitely want companies making commitments where they don't know how to get there. That's what leadership is. And it's not empty because what we find is when you set that big audacious goal, particularly when it comes from the CEO, that gives a very important internal signal within a company that this is what we're going to do. And it really opens up the space for innovation. And I always say, if you know, if you make a 90% commitment, every one of the company thinks that they're in the 10%. It's like, oh, it's nice we're doing that. It doesn't apply to me. When you make a 100% commitment, you signal across the company, we're all doing this. And it's really critical. And we see a big success when CEOs get behind it. So things like the big Walmart announcement we had a couple of weeks ago at Climate Week, you know, you've got the CEO of Walmart, the biggest company in the world, making a big commitment. There's no way that we're not going to follow up and check that he delivers on that and hold him accountable. Well, we should talk about how you actually hold people accountable. But Maria, in the meantime, did you want to sort of talk about when a Walmart makes a commitment? Of course, it's not just for them. It's for the entire supply chain. So I was thinking maybe you could weigh in on the question of how you include smaller and medium sized businesses and everything that's going on. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, and, be, and before going there, I think what's important uh, to note is that when companies are making these public announcements, they have been walked through the company, uh, through the different committees, and they get to the board of the company. So actually, companies are not putting commitments out there just uh, because they feel it's the right thing and PR strategy. I think there is a lot of um, debate, a lot of discussion within the companies, and a lot of question inside the companies, if we're going to go out with these uh, targets, and we're not completely sure on how we're going to get there, how are we going to respond? Are we going to be criticized? So sometimes, uh, you know, when I when I look at the criticisms that I hear, I say, well, I think we should focus on those companies that are not doing enough, because it is arguably understandable that some companies do not know whether their clean products are going to be sold. I remember an example from Ikea when she, the CSO, she told me, Listen, when we came with the electric vehicle um, target, we, we didn't have a clue on how we were going to do it. And then five, let, they, five years later, they had achieved that target five years in advance, okay? Right. So I think you just need to, to trust them that once you put the leadership behind, and that leadership is through different committees, that the company is going to push as much as they can. And sometimes they will face barriers, and that's where the climate group, WBCSD, BSR, and other companies of the coalition are working with those companies to remove some of the barriers. But it's not they're doing it with the best intentions to meet what they're doing. That doesn't mean that we should not hold them accountable and make sure that they report regularly on progress. And this is something that we need to do. Now, coming to the uh, SMEs, as you know, uh, big multinationals, most of the emissions, the scope three emissions, 90% or more, come from the supply chains. So uh, for any company, for Walmart, Amazon, you name it, and you will see it, you know, it is fundamental that they engage with SMEs. And that's why the, the Women Business Coalition, together with ICC and Exponential Roadmap, launched this, uh, the SME Climate Hub. This is because we want SMEs to also commit to climate action. We want to have a million SMEs, it's quite aspirational, to commit to climate wow. action. We want to provide them tools, and also we want to provide them incentives. So we want the big multinationals to tell them, you also need to be aligned with net zero. Well, that's very ambitious. I just want to say that we're getting some audience questions and I want to share them with you. Uh, there's a question from Rebecca in Houston and she asked if Helen can provide a link to the poll she mentioned. Uh, and then- uh Yes, I don't know how to do it technically, but they're publicly available, so we could, there's, there's someone can make that happen, I'm sure, yeah. Okay, uh, we'll have to figure out how that technically can happen. And then we also have a question, uh, someone says, Michael Mann said at Bloomberg Green that we only have four years to avert climate disaster. Do you believe that that's true? Helen? I think, yeah. Oh, Maria? Well, I can, I can take this one. 
Yeah, I think we, we need to, to reduce uh, in the next decade the emissions by half. This is removing 27 gigatons from the atmosphere uh, that, that are not released. Uh, and so that in itself is quite a big challenge. So, I mean, uh, Michael, it's right. If we don't uh, set the, the, the direction now, we are not going to achieve that and then it will be difficult to, to achieve the, the Paris Agreement. So the next year is a fundamental the good story is that we are going to inject, uh, at least in Europe, 500 billion and hopefully uh, trillions in the US um, towards uh, clean technologies so that we can get there. Okay, uh, I'm looking for our poll results and I'm trying to pull them up just so that we can all, I just wanted everyone to know how people uh, um, thought, but it looks like 42% think that policy incentives is the right way to go. Uh, only 23% think investor demands make a difference um, and 25% think commitment for business. So I think that it's pretty clear that um, policy incentives, oh, and only 8% think it's coalition building. <laughs> so I think we're, we're all pretty clear that governments have to provide policy incentives uh, to move forward. Um, if you... Uh, if you were thinking of the policy incentives you'd most like to see from governments, uh, and we only have five minutes left, so maybe we can each do a brief answer, what would you most like to see? Uh, Helen? Yeah, I think it's interesting to see that because my answer to that poll was, well, you've got to do all of that stuff. And I think to, to link that to the Michael Mann point just made, these are the absolute critical years for the climate. Halving emissions by 2030, and then getting down to net zero by 2050, we've got to do all of the above all the time and at great speed. And so for that reason, when you think about things like policy incentives, we look a lot at the interaction between markets and policies. We bring together these big demand side commitments and then we use those both to sort of say to the supply side, if you think about something like electric vehicles, say to the suppliers, you need to provide more vehicles. The demand is there and give the suppliers the surety that the market is there, but also say to governments, look, if you change these policies, actually you will accelerate the market. So for electric vehicles, we've been pushing very hard for an, uh, bringing forward the end date at which combustion engines will be sold. A lot of governments have set a 2040 date we're campaigning to bring that forward to 2030. And it's those sort of incentives where you can see that the businesses are leading on this agenda, are making these big commitments. So understanding how you can help use policy to shape markets, to allow businesses to achieve what they need to do. I think that's the, that's the virtuous circle that we think a lot about. And so designing policies like that. And I would also say, encourage people not just to think about the national government or the federal government, we work also with state and regional governments and looking at what you know California and others are doing and how they're shaping markets and setting the right policy incentives there is really important as well. Okay, so we uh, the virtuous circle is a very important idea. We're, uh, we're going to give you the last say. We only have uh, two to three minutes left. So what do you have to say? If we had to do policy initiatives um, and keeping an eye on the virtuous circle, uh, carbon tax, the terribly named carbon tax, but uh, what do you, what would you like to see most happen in the next uh, six months? Yes, we have done a study uh, to, to analyze how to invest and provide incentives to the, to the stimulus packages. And there are five measures uh, that we have included is investing in renewable energy, on the grid, on electric uh, vehicles, on energy efficiency and natural climate solutions. And the one and the winning winning one is invest in electric vehicles so provide incentive scrappage schemes where we will we, we replace internal combustion engine cars with electric vehicles and those bring the best uh, results in terms of job creation gdp and together with renewable energy deployment uh, deployment on uh, ghg emissions i think we should not forget natural climate solutions they bring a lot of jobs economic growth in local communities that are very much heated by covid and also produce a large amount of, of emission reduction. So, so when when governments uh, look at incentive, inevitably they need to look at, at how to optimize the three elements that I mentioned: jobs, economic growth, and GHG emissions.